Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Forum, a podcast by the Diplomacy Law and Policy Forum. Today, we're going to be talking to you about the law of occupation. And we have with us Ras Nabil, who is a research associate at the Research Society of International Law. So, Ras, let's start off with the basics on the law of occupation. How do we define what an occupation is? So, an occupation is basically defined as when a foreign power uh, exercises effective control over a territory. Um, and usually that foreign power would constitute a hostile army um, because their presence in the territory is not consented to by the local population. Um, and so the, they exercise de facto authority. So that usually constitutes administrative control as well as judicial control, not necessarily legislative control, because occupiers do have to respect the local legislation uh, of the occupied territory insofar as possible. So you can contrast um, an occupation from an invasion because invasions are usually um, aimed at establishing sovereign title over the invaded territory. Um, Occupations do not necessarily aim to establish title over um, this occupied territory, but rather they aim to establish some form of control for other motives such as uh, establishing a military advantage Um, trying to get the enemy army to sort of admit defeat in a war. And so that occupation takes place in order to then ensure public order and safety of the civilian population, while also trying to leverage a military position in a conflict. Yeah, and I think that's one of the misconceptions I had before looking into occupation, that when you had a territory invade, Um, another per, another state's territory or even because we've seen that it can apply to disputed territory as well. So where you have a state in way disputed or other another state's territory, for me, that was immediately then an occupation. But then when you look at it and when you look at what the ICJ said in DRC versus, versus Uganda, they said you can't really have um, an occupation in battle areas because you don't have that requirement that the ousted sovereign's um, authority has been substituted. Exactly. So until you have that, and I, I, I'm, I'm still a bit iffy about whether effective control is required, because yeah. when we look at the text from Article 42, Hague regulations, and we know that they're from so far ago, yeah. they're from 1907, it says sufficient authority. Yeah. And so now the way we interpret that in international law, given everything else that's happened, given the Nicaragua judgments, given state responsibility, we look at that as effective control. But my my bugbear about this is whether the threshold is perhaps a bit lower in the sense that you just require that sufficient authority. But but maybe we'll we'll go on to that. But yeah. I, I like that you mentioned from the off that this is different from an invasion yeah. because you have the this tripartite Uh, criteria which are required to be filled, which is territory, hostile army, and uh, sufficient authority. Yeah. So when we're looking, and you, you've alluded to this a little bit already, in the sense that the competing interests that you have as an occupying power. So ITEL recognizes that an occupation is a state of fact. It does not give you sovereign title to that territory. And as an occupier, you are constantly balancing three interests, your own interests, the interest of the population that you occupy and the interest of the ousted sovereign. Yeah. So how does it seek to do that? So um, IHL, does, so international humanitarian law does regulate um, the law of occupation um, through three primary instruments. Again, this is apart from customary international humanitarian law. So the first of that would be, um, again, the Hague regulations of 1907, where you have articles 42, 43, as well as other provisions that apply. Um, you have the fourth Geneva Convention that is primarily targeted in protecting civilians during conflict, but there's a whole dedicated chapter to um, the the law of occupation in GC4. And then this is also supplemented by some provisions in additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions. Um, so the main aim of the law, if you look at the text of the fourth Geneva Convention, is to ensure the welfare of the civilian population. So if you go through the text, you'll see that it mentions that the occupying power must respect These, these rights um, of the civilian populations, and that uh, ranges from, for example, the provision of basic necessities, food, water, health care, and also then curbing the, um, the sort of range of military force that they can use. So again, it prioritizes the protection of the civilian population. It also then protects the 
the ousted sovereign's um, authority to some extent, whereby uh, if you look at Article 42 of the Hague, Regu uh, Article 43 of the Hague Regulations, actually, um, the occupying power is only entitled to exercise control over matters such as public order and safety. Um, and in doing so, they're only maintaining control over the administrative, the executive, and the judicial functions. Mm. Um, they cannot um, sort of abrogate from the laws in place um, in the occupied territory. And that is in Unless itself. Unless absolutely prevented. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's great that you brought that up because the language of that provision itself is quite contested. Uh, yes. we, don't, we don't really know what parameters <laughs> constitute until unless absolutely prevented. Yeah, so I read an article by Dinstein where he was saying, mm, the word absolutely doesn't really mean absolute and actually it's of no great consequence really. And I was like, how treaty interpretation, let's go to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. What is the ordinary meaning of the term absolutely? Yeah. It's absolute, yeah. right? <laughs> it's pretty high, it's a very high threshold. Unless you are absolutely prevented from doing so, so we have that under Article 43. Then you have Article 64 of the 14 Geneva Convention, yeah. which says that actually to enforce the convention, you can change some of the laws, yeah. especially the penal, the penal laws. Yeah. The ICRC has then said that it applies to the civil laws. So for me, when you look at that in the context of what they did in Iraq, yeah. the, the extent to which that was a transformative occupation, where you had... Um, I've totally forgotten the American official's name now, but he sat down and he rewrote the Iraqi constitution. And he rewrote the Iraqi constitution and they even changed the tax laws applicable in Iraq yeah. at the time. And they allowed for the IMF and they allowed for the World Bank to have their interventionist programs in the country. So you have gone way far beyond that. And we yeah. had, there was an article written by John Yu where he attempted to justify this as being entirely legal on the basis of Article 43. We, we could not abide by the laws that were there before. And of course, then you have all of these accusations of how they're not human rights friendly. Yeah. And also he relied on Article 64. And you're like, okay, you went into Iraq, you underwent this process of debathification. But when you look at the text, how can you change the tax laws in a country under the law of occupation? I don't think that there is in any way a justification for that. Yeah, again, I think that also goes to the problem of enforcing um, the, the various rules pertaining to the law of occupation, um, as we've seen also uh, with Israel. Yeah. Um, very conveniently, I would say, they're also not a party to the uh, Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court. However, there have been documented uh, gross violations of human rights law. Um, constituting war crimes as defined under the Rome Statute. However, because they've not accepted to, uh, they've not accepted the the ICC's uh, jurisdiction, they cannot th therefore be tried under that. So I think that's yeah. also one of the issues with the fact that okay, you know, we have a body of law that's pretty comprehensive in terms of what is what are the rights of occupiers, the occupied territory, uh, the, uh, the occupied civilian population, the ousted sovereign. But then the enforcement can be a problem, and we and we're seeing that. Yeah, quite and I, I want to talk to you about that in the context of human rights. But yeah. even before we go into that, in the context of what you've raised regarding the war crimes and the fact that Israel is not party to the Rome Statute, Palestine is a party to the yeah. Rome Statute, um, and I think that investigation now is ongoing. But the um, the only war crime that you have in occupied territory beyond beyond issues of distinction proportionality, which are uh, applicable in any armed conflict, um, you is the one of demographic transfer, which we find yeah. in Article 49 of Geneva Convention 4, which yes. prohibits an occupying uh, power from transferring its civilian population into occupied territory. And so you have that in the sense of these settler colonies being yeah. created in occupied Palestinian territory by Israel. Yes. And so, but for me, Iraq would not come as a war crime, despite it being a transformative occupation, but that is a war crime. So yeah. I feel like we, we do have a little bit of a, an issue in the Rome statute in the sense that we don't have both of these being war crimes, which I think that they should be, uh, perhaps because there's more leeway even within yeah. the, the text even within the, uh, the relevant treaties for that. So when we had the World Advisory Opinion, we had the ICJ hold that 
Israel was bound not only by the law of occupation by IHL, but it was also bound by international human rights law in the in terms of the covenants that it had ratified, yeah. such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Yeah. Um, so much has been said about the application of human rights in times of armed conflict. Do you want to talk to me a little bit about how that applies? Yeah, so um, basically there is a concept in international law called lex specialis that basically means that um, there is a specific legal regime that would be applicable to a certain situation. And so with the law of occupation being recognized as one of conflict, so you would apply the rules of IHL, international humanitarian law, which would be the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Regulations, customary international humanitarian law. Um, and so what IHL does is it sort of identifies and distinguishes between different classes of persons. So you have combatants, you have non-combatants, and within non-combatants you have, for example, prisoners of war, civilians, persons or to combat, etc. And so what IHL does is basically, okay, um, if you are a combatant, you can be targeted in hostilities or in military operations. And that, again, would be subject to considerations of necessity and proportionality. But, um, again, it also then protects certain people from being targeted. So non-combatants, as a general rule, are not allowed to be targeted under IHL. So it gives different people protection based on their status as they are recognized in um, a situation of conflict, including occupation. However, human rights law will apply to everyone, regardless. Human rights law applies to all citizens, all persons, um, regardless of their status, regardless of their position within a military structure or not. And so the issue then arises that in a situation of conflict where you have IHL rules governing who can be targeted, who can legitimately have their life taken away, through military operations versus human rights law, which says you cannot take anyone's life. How do you balance these two competing considerations? Similarly, if you look at the right to fair trial during occupations, during conflicts, you'll have the establishment of military tribunals, which have speedier trials, um, less stringent evidentiary requirements um, versus uh, the right to fair trial under international human rights law, which has significant sort of sub rights. So procedural requirements, evidentiary requirements, and so these two seem to be at odds with one another, yeah. but this opinion says that even though they're at odds with one another, yeah. they still apply within the same territory at the same time. Yeah. So that's the sort of gray area. And I think you are in a better <laughs> position to, to so respond to this because you feel quite strongly yeah. about this. So I, I, I think that this is something that requires so much more thought. And I think that we're fleshing it out so much more in the sense of, um, and I think often, especially when I'm teaching students, you have students come from human rights law and then they study war law. And in war law, then you have to immediately tell them, yeah. actually, war law accepts that people will die. Yeah. And that is something that in human rights is like, no, yeah. inalienable right to, <laughs> right to life, in inalienable right to human dignity. Yeah. That is the premise of uh, human rights law. In IHL, the premise is, the rationale underpinning it is, let's reduce human suffering as much as we can in yeah. wartime. Those two things for me, as similar as they sound, seem to be somewhat irreconcilable. For sure. In a lot of ways, and especially when you look at the fact that you have the right to life under the ICCPR, the right to not be arbitrarily deprived of your yeah. life. And so looking at it in the sense of the Lex Specialis, which is to read that into the word arbitrary, works for the right to life. Sure. But it doesn't work in the sense of detention. Yeah. So that's been an ongoing issue. And I think the argument to be made for human rights applying makes sense in the sense of prolonged occupations sure. because you didn't have that conceived in IHL. So when we look at IHL, it, it uses the term usufruct, right? You are holding okay. this territory as a usufruct. You are there in a, on a temporary basis. Israel has been occupying Palestine since 1947. We did not have that envisaged. You have the Turkey occupation of northern Cyprus. These are really long, protracted occupations, which we're not really going to be seeing an end to in sight currently. Yeah. So the argument then is, what happens to the welfare of that civilian population? What happens to their rights of education? Sure. What happens to their right to health? 
My issue is that you have that in the Fourth Geneva Convention. You have Article 50, which is talking about the right to education of the occupied population. Yeah. You have Articles 55 and 56, which talk about the right to health, the right to foodstuffs. And the other issue I have is that human rights are just so clear and so comprehensive. Yeah. Exactly what you were talking about, the right to a fair trial. You have now these third generation rights, right? So you have the right to peace. You have the right to um, a clean environment. Yeah, yeah you ha those are, to me, impossible to reconcile with an ongoing armed conflict, yeah. even if it is one in which there is not ongoing and constant hostilities. Sure. So I think that that's something that we haven't quite worked out in the sense that you have this human rights movement and exactly what you're talking about, adjudicative forums. We now have those. Why are we getting so many cases at the European Court of Human Rights about how the British are treating the Iraqi detainees and their power? It's yeah. all coming from these um, forums and we don't have those. Yeah. In ITIL, we don't have those. But again, are we are we going too far? Are we now going to see more states derogating? Because they're going to be like, hey, I can't, this encroachment of human rights onto a battlefield, I don't really accept. Yeah. Uh, so those are things that I think we're going to have to look at. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think some of the points that you've pointed out, especially with the notion of protracted occupations that we're seeing yeah. today, in light of that, do you think that uh, the law of occupation as espoused under the Fourth Geneva Convention, under the Hague Regulations, yeah. do you think it still is relevant? Does it need to be revisited? If it does need to be revisited, can it feasibly be revisited yeah, at all? Yeah, yeah. And I think that this is a conversation we keep on having in so many realms. So yeah. even in terms of cyber attacks, like do we need an entirely new instrument? And it's just about how realistic is it that we're going to have states come around um, a table you had that momentum post the second world war you had yeah. that momentum post vietnam are we really going to see that momentum yeah. now especially given the amount of multipolarity in the world i doubt yeah. it so then i'm like let's look at the existing text yeah. and let's see and for me sure they've come from 1907 that's yeah. so that's over 100 years yeah. ago right and so you're thinking, how is that relevant to what we're seeing today? But in so many ways, it was very forward thinking for the time. So even sure. under Article 3 of the Hague Regulations, you have the right to compensation. You have the right to compensation if there has been a breach of international of the regulations, which I think is a, a really yeah, big pretty, deal for yeah. at that time. Um, and all of these other, you know, they were already in 1949 thinking about the right to education of people in occupied territory. They were thinking about whether you should change the laws there, to what extent you should do that, what rights do the occupied population have. So I think given these laws as they stand are not really being um, applied in the sense that you have occupations which are becoming annexations. Yeah. Um, so where the occupying power is trying to take over in terms of... Sovereign titles. Yeah, in terms of sovereign titles. So I think that perhaps we shouldn't focus on looking at changing the laws, what's the best way to come up with a solution for that, but looking in the sense of oversight mechanisms, yeah. which are not so polit heavily politicized, because I think um, the issue comes when you leave everything with the P5, that you don't have this happening. But maybe we should go more to the General Assembly, maybe we should have more oversight mechanisms over occupied situations, and looking at whether these have been complied with. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that was a really interesting discussion, getting into the uh, roots of the laws of occupation and all of the issues with it. Uh, we hope you enjoyed watching this at home, and please tune in for future episodes.